We, uh, we will do that song again next week. Um, and I appreciate, appreciate getting to learn it together. Uh, a lot of times when we, when we introduce a new song, we just kind of jump in and praise team sounds great. They've had chances to rehearse it, but uh, amateurs like myself are kind of going, ah. So it was nice. That was nice. Nice to do that together. So I don't know if you noticed or not. I'm sure you did because you're all so incredibly bright. But the songs today, the song service today has been full of a lot of praise and worship and joy and praise and worship and joy. And then some praise and worship and joy. There's a reason for that. So is the sermon. Right in the middle of All Things Rooted, a series that explores an aspect of our theme, Rooted, And what we're doing is looking at familiar stories in Scripture and looking at how the characters were either rooted or not rooted. And today we have that contrast. What happens when, with faith when it is rooted and not rooted? And in today's episode, we'll even see a character who is a man of faith, and yet his actions are not rooted and consequently quite expensive. And there's a message there for us. It's a story that you've heard uh, uh, many, many times. And it's right in the middle of a story of great joy. And I always wondered, why is it there? So that's what we're going to explore today. Today, David dances and Uzzah falls down. And not only does David dance, but David jumps, which is where the sermon title comes from, jump. But as you notice on the order of worship, it's jump, question mark. Oh, and then I didn't finish it out. <laughs> it's supposed to say jump, question mark, and then in parentheses, Exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. You know, so there were three exclamation points, right? You got that? Okay. Something very interesting about the Hebrew word for dance and for jump. So before we get into the story, before we get into the narrative, I want to look at the family of words for dance in the Old Testament. It is always, there's an asterisk there, a joyful act of worship. Miriam, after uh, Israel had crossed a, Israel had crossed across the Red Sea, and they got through on dry land. Great story there, right? And then Egypt, an incredibly powerful army chasing after them, enters into the Red Sea going across that dry land that God has dried, and then God allows the two sides of water to come back together, killing the Egyptian army. A complete victory for Israel through the hand of God. The Egyptian army, perhaps the most powerful in the world at the time, is decimated, destroyed, completely overwhelmed without a military piece of equipment being lifted against them because that's how big God is. And in fact, God's a whole lot bigger than that. When that happens, Miriam begins to dance. She and the, the ladies of Israel dance in joyous celebration and honor of God. They worship God in movement and in dance. And I don't know if you've ever been there where something was so good in your life that you just had to move. You just, you had to do something. You couldn't sit still. 
I don't know if you've ever been to a football game at UT Stadium or A&M Stadium or your professional or collegiate or high school or middle school or whatever's favorite place to play team. And they come back in the fourth quarter and at the last moment, they score a touchdown that wins the game. And what happens? Everyone sits there and goes, Oh, nicely done. Gentlemen. Nicely done. No, everybody jumps up and they're screaming and people that don't know each other are hugging and high-fiving each other. And it's just pandelirium. It's just wonderful. That's the intensity of what happened when Miriam began dancing. It's the intensity of what's going on with David as he dances in this moment. That the goodness of God, that the victory of God is so present and so real and so overwhelmingly joyful that they cannot stand still. They must leap and dance and twirl and praise. Well, the word that is used when Miriam is dancing, and also in 149, in what Sherry so beautifully read, for dance is that joyful act of unrestricted worship, unrestrictable worship. I'm going to butcher the pronunciation, but you know, in case you're ever playing Bible trivia, you can throw this one out. Makal. Or it may be Mikhail. Mikhail. Whatever. It's a great word. It is context dependent, however. You remember I said that the Hebrew word family for dance is always a joyful act of worship with an asterisk. This is one of several Hebrew words for dance. This is the one that's very context sensitive. When used of Miriam, when used in Psalm 149, it is a dance of praise to the Lord. It is inspired, ignited by that joyous overflowing that can't be contained. It's also used for labor pains. Now, in the days before the epidural, it was not uncommon that in labor pains, women would scream. I know you find that hard to believe. In the days of epidurals, it is not uncommon for when those real contractions are kicking in, For the woman to grab her husband because she cannot contain herself and say, why did you do this to me? It's the same word that's used for Miriam dancing and women grabbing at their husband's throats. In 2 Samuel, where we'll find the story of David dancing, in 1 Chronicles 15, where We also find that story, and really you need both to inform each other and to give us the full picture of what's going on here. It's a different word, chahra, kahra, kahrar, (laughs) something like that. It's in the vicinity, perhaps. That word for dancing is a purposeful twirling of joy. And and while I wouldn't say professional, it would be one that is practiced. It is choreography, exuberant choreography. Uh, And then the word that is used for leaping in 2 Samuel 6, uh, and where is that exactly? That is... I really should separate these out so that I can get to them easier. Verse 16, 2 Samuel 6, verse 16. David is leaping and dancing. That is a purposeful leap, whereas the the word translated dancing is a purposeful twirling, a joyful purposeful twirling. The word for leaping, this is a great word, pause as. Oh, I really like that one. It's akin to what we see in ballet, when, and I'm not going to demonstrate it for you because it would be quite embarrassing. 
However, I guess part of the point of the lesson is that worshiping God should be beyond being embarrassed. I don't know what they call it. Um, if the Fitzgibbons were here, they could tell us what the name is. Maybe somebody knows the name. When, when, when a pirouette, that's when the knee is up and they go in circles. I've, I won't do that because I'll fall on my face and I'm at the age where things would break. Uh, right. And then what's the one where they kick out? Anyone? Anyone? That hurt just doing that. I didn't even get any air. Anyway, those purposeful, beautiful, emotional leaps. And so what David's doing is not just going around, I almost said hunky-dory, but, you know, just bleh. He is dancing this beautiful, emotional dance. Now, Twa and I, we love to sing. Twyla's a singer, right? And we watch every one of the American Idol, The Voice. There were even some group ones that they had that were horrible, and we suffered through many of them. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And we would say, oh, I really like them. Oh, they kind of strained on the high notes. Oh, they were a little bit flat on that one part. But I kind of, you know, get in there, get a little critical. Not, not to be mean, but just as we were deciding who was, you know, worthy of being the winner of that competition. And then we'd watch, So You Think You Can Dance. Now, don't know anything about dance. And while some of the dancers were obviously better than others, what struck us was the emotion of the pieces. And there were some dance numbers where we were, we were in tears and puddles on the floor. And there were some when we just would say, yeah, wow, that was awesome. Sometimes we'd just break out clapping. And one day, we, Twyla said, why is it that dance moves us so emotionally, but singing doesn't? And we really had to think about that. And it came down to, we don't know anything about dance. And so when it's done well, and it brings us in, our defenses are down. We're not, we're not watching the dance critically. We're watching the dance for the story, for the emotion of the moment. And so we get sucked into it. We join in with it. Whereas when the singers were singing, we would say, well, I don't know about that. Yeah. But there have been a couple of singers. More than a couple. That halfway through the song, we quit being critical. And we begin to listen in order to hear and feel where they were going. That's what David's doing here. David is a practiced dancer. David is, again, I don't want to use prof the word professional, but he is telling a story in his dance. He is exuberant and exuding praise and worship to the Lord, and he is leading the nation that he has been just given very recently to lead. He is leading them in worship as the ark is coming back to Jerusalem. The Philistines had it previous, and which would be a great story to tell at some point. You never thought there were hemorrhoids in the Bible, but they're there. And David's joy is just cannot be contained, is overflowing. And so he does what he's good at, what he has practiced, and he gives it over to the Lord in praise. Much like when he went into battle with Goliath and picked up the five smooth stones. He was a fighter. He knew how to use that sling. It wasn't just, if you'll show up, God will provide the miracle. David knew that it was a symbiotic relationship, that he was doing God's work and that God was with him and would give him the victory, but he knew that he would have to exercise his skills in doing so. He was joining God in the fight. Which is why he picked up five and not just one, right? If it was a miracle moment that required no effort, he could have picked up a twig or a leaf or a small stone or whatever. But he picked up five smooth, read aerodynamically true stones. And he went in with the conviction that if the first one didn't do it, 
he'd throw the second. If the second one didn't do it, he'd throw the third. If the third one didn't do it, the fourth, and then the fifth, and then whatever it took to bring home the victory for God. That's what he's doing here. His practiced worship is leading the people of Israel in this great moment of God restoring all things, which is a glimpse into next week's table talk. God restoring all things to the way they should be. All right. That's an introduction. Now, I want to show you a painting that apparently is famous, um, but it depicts the scene of David dancing. Now, I don't know about you. That makes me a little uncomfortable. I'm not sure that I'm ready for liturgical worship, liturgical dance in worship. Especially a man in a dress. I just don't know how well I would have it. But I think that's part of the point. Now, what he was wearing was not necessarily unusual in that day, right? Except that what he was wearing is what the priests were wearing. David was purposefully associating himself with the priesthood. The priesthood that was called to carry the ark to lead the people in worship. He was assuming his role as a king to be a priestly role. Now, I don't think that was a blind assumption at all. I think it was a God-honoring assumption that the most important thing is to be strictly and completely obedient to God and to lead the people in that life and in that worship. So he had a linen ephod and a, and a, and a, a robe that was matching and he led the people in dancing. Okay, that's all I can take of that. Let's go to the next one. All right, so now let's get into the story. David leaps and dances. And I ran out of room to say, and us don't. 2 Samuel chapter 6 and 1 Chronicles 15. So you know the story. But it's really interesting. Listen to how things play out. David gathers the chosen men of Israel. These are the warriors of Israel, the leaders of Israel, 30,000 of them. Again, significance in that. Remember, 10,000 is 10 four times, right? 10, 100,000, 10,000. The architectural perfection of four. 10 is that perfect number of, of God and humanity coming together uh, for a task. And then 30,000, which would be another three. So there's this, this magic that's going on in here. This, and I, when I say magic, I'm talking about David is purposefully playing into this numerology in order to say that this was a holy thing that was taking place. Now keep that in mind. Keep David's motivations, intentions, directions in mind, and, and we'll get to Uzzah in just a moment. And we're going to see that as David's we tend to think of David's as right on track and Uzzah's as somehow off track. We're going to see that's not necessarily the full case. Even as great a leader as David was, there was still room for him to grow. Mistakes were made making assumptions on God's behalf. This is a cautionary tale to all of us. To those of us that play loose with scriptures and to those of us that are really trying hard, we all need to be very careful to be properly obedient to the word of God or our worship is in vain. Let's get into it. 30,000. And they go there to bring the ark of God into Jerusalem. Symbolically, the ark is where the Lord of hosts, the God of armies, often thought of as the God of angel armies, sits enthroned on the cherub. Now, we know, and Israel knew, the Jews knew, that you can't contain God in a box or on a box. 
not going to happen. It was the symbolic presence of the Lord. Now, again, hearkening back to where the ark had previously been captured by the Philistines, the Philistines had put the ark, the presence of God, because they, that's what they believed, that the, the, their gods were encased in their, their most holy idols. And they put them in front of their god, Dagon, in a position of submission before Dagon. Look, Dagon, we captured Israel's guard, God, here. He's, he's bowing before you now, just as the people of Israel bow to us. Then, of course, the next morning they go into worship and Dagon's face down before the ark of God. <laughs> I love that story. Anyway, the Jews knew better and knew it was, it was a symbolic, but a very, very special and wonderful thing because God had said, this is how we will proceed. So they had great respect for the ark of God. Okay, so they go and they get it and listen to this. In verse 3, they carried the ark of God on a new cart. That's an echo of what the Philistines did when the Philistines had had enough and sent it back. Theirs was kind of a test. We're going to put on a brand new ark with girl cows that have never pulled anything before and see what happens. And it went straight back to Israel. So that's what David does. I mean, it worked there. He put it on a brand new cart, brought it out of the house of Abinadab. I love Hebrew names, which was on a hill. And Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, were driving the new cart with the ark of God. And Ahio went before the ark. You got the picture. David and all the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. And when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah put out his hand to the ark, to the ark of God, and took hold of it, for the oxen had stumbled. And the anger of Yahweh God was kindled against Uzzah, and God struck him down because of his error, and he died there beside the ark of God. I mean, he was just trying to help. Why would God strike him down? In fact, David says David was angry. There's this visceral response in David's gut because Yahweh God had broken out, and it's very interesting in the Hebrew. God's name is here, and, and the word for broken out is repeated on both sides of, of God. I mean, God is ticked. Not just a little mad. He is furious. God's anger had boiled over against Uzzah, and that place is called Perez Uzzah to this day, which means against Uzzah. And David was afraid of the Lord that day. You hear that? David was, and the Hebrew word is very specific here, he was afraid of the Lord. It was like a little kid getting caught with his hand in the cookie jar after he'd been told, if you take another cookie, I'm going to beat you black and blue. I mean, it was like, the fear that happens when caught under threat. And David said, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? You hear what he's saying? These guys, this is brand new. They were trying to serve the Lord and, and God killed this guy. How can, how can it be in my presence? I'm not worthy. I'm not good enough. I, I don't know. I don't know what's happening. Well, I'll tell you what happened because I've had a chance to study this all week and had a blast with it. David, I, I hope that didn't... Sometimes I say things, and I wish I could put them back in my mouth because of the way I think they sounded. I hope that didn't come out as condescending in any, any stretch, because I, I, I never understood why God did this to us. We're fixing to go over that there is a direct command not to touch the ark. But I'm thinking, he was just trying to help. Because that's what we do nowadays, isn't it? Oh, that man killed 18 people, but his daddy spanked him when he was little. You know what I'm saying? We make excuses for everything. And nothing's ever my fault, for sure. There's always a reason that Trump's... You also almost have to quit using that word because you lose half the audience anytime you do. There's always a reason that supersedes 
the instruction. But not today. First Chronicles 15, verse 2. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me find it. Let me find it. Let me find it. Yes, I'm sorry. Deuteronomy chapter 10. The Lord sets apart the tribe of Levi to, to minister to the Lord, to minister to Yahweh, and to carry the Ark of the Covenant for the Lord. No one else is to touch it. No one else is to carry it. No one else is to stand before it except for the Levites. We have an echo of that when John... John the Baptist's dad. No, his name wasn't John. <laughs> it's not December, so I don't remember these details. Zechariah, right? Am I right? Yeah, okay. When he goes <laughs> to make, I'm just, you know, when he does his thing and then he gets struck dumb because he didn't believe what the angel of the Lord told him. Uh, but only the Levites could go into the Holy of Holy Places where the Ark of the Covenant sat. Deuteronomy 10, 8 says, at that time, the Lord set apart the tribe of Levi to carry the ark of the covenant of the Lord, to stand before the Lord, to minister to him, and to bless in his name unto this day. So God separated the Levites to be his ministers, ministers to him and ministers to the people, and to handle all things ark-related. They were the only ones allowed to touch it. In fact, the ark was made of acacia wood, which I never knew what it was, but now we have floors in our home made of acacia wood. It's so pretty. Anyway, on the ark, as, as it's being built, as it's being designed, you shall cast four rings of gold for it and put them on its four feet. Two rings on one side of it, two rings on the other side of it. It's almost like the sign at, at the businesses. This door must remain unlocked during business hours. You wonder why that started, don't you? Business owners sitting there all day. Nobody's coming in. What's happening? Maybe we should unlock the door. Oh, let's put up a sign. Anyway, you shall make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold, and you shall put the poles into the rings on the side of the ark in order to carry the ark by them. The poles shall remain in the rings of the ark. They shall not be taken from it. Specific instructions meant for obedience, extreme obedience. David didn't follow that when he was bringing the ark in. And so the worship that he had exuded, that he and the 30,000 chosen men of Israel, that he and the people of Israel were giving up to God, added up to false worship in the eyes of God because they had broken his sacred laws and put it on an unused cart, on a new cart, instead of on the poles and be carried by the Levites. Levites. Now, this is where 1 Chronicles 15 comes into play. In 1 Chronicles 15, we have this notice that David says, no one but the Levites may carry the ark of God at this point in, in, when you're comparing the two stories. For the Lord has chosen them to carry the ark and to minister to him forever. And as he gathers the Levites together and gives them their assignments, then he continues by saying, because you did not carry it the first time. And I don't, he's not casting blame. In fact, I think he's admitting. Because the Levites did not carry it the first time, the Lord, our God, broke out against us. You see, not broke out against you, but against us, because we did not seek him 
according to the rule. I love that phrase. David, a man after God's own heart, who is elevated to the place of being the prince of Egypt, the king of e- the earthly king of Egypt, of Israel. Somebody flag me down when I do something like that. Messed up. Messed up big. And it's very easy for us, those of us that have been in the church year after year after year after year, studying our Bibles day after day after day after year after year, decade after decade, to get to the point where we are comfortable and think we know what we're doing and we can't let ourselves get there. We can only know the mind and the heart of the Lord and we are actively seeking His wisdom, His instruction, His will, meditating on His Word, walking with Him, testing our faith, exercising His compassion, His love, His kindness in this world. So David goes to get it back, back where they had left it in the house of Obed-Edom. And it was time to go back and get it because David had heard that the house of Obed-Edom had been blessed for housing the ark. And verse 13 of 2 Samuel 6 says, and when those prepares the Levites and he takes the Levites. They put it on the poles and do it right. When those who bore the ark of the Lord had gone six steps. So now it's the same picture as the first time where David goes and is rejoicing. But after six steps, he sacrificed an ox and a fatted animal. And David danced before the Lord with all his might. And he was wearing a linen ephod, this priestly undergarment, so that uh, David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the horn. There was worship going on throughout this journey back back to its symbolic proper home. But it was carried right this time. Those who bore the ark of the Lord, We did it right this time. We put the Levites in there. We respected the will of God, the word of God, and we did it his way. And when we did it his way, the worship was pleasing to God. Sorry. So David and the elders of Israel and the commanders of thousands went up to bring, this is 1 Chronicles version, the ark of the covenant of the Lord from the house of Obed-Edom with rejoicing. And because God helped the Levites, the sister companion phrase in 2 Samuel is those who bore the ark of the Lord. And because God helped the Levites who were carrying the ark of the covenant, they sacrificed. David was clothed with a robe of fine linen. And he also wore, as also were all the Levites who were carrying the ark. And the singers, and the leader of the music of the singers, and David wore a linen ephod. Again, establishing himself, proclaiming, not proclaiming himself, but entering in with the Levites, I think symbolically to say, I will be literally obedient. I will follow your word to the letter. I will minister to you. I will minister to the the people that you have given me to minister to. And I will lead them in worship because you are our great king. So all of Israel, you notice how that progresses. When David does that, when when it's revealed that that's what David is doing, All of Israel brings up the Ark of the Covenant with shouting the sound of the horn, the trumpets, the cymbals, and made loud music on harps and lyres. 
And in First Chronicle, it kind of condenses what the rest of Second Samuel is. And First Chronicle just says, as the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came to the city of David, Michal, the daughter of Saul, looked out of the window and saw King David dancing and celebrating, and she despised him in her heart. Jump back to First Samuel. So the house of Israel. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord, the shouting with the sound of the horn. As the ark of Yahweh, the Lord, came into the city of David, Michal, the daughter of Saul, looked out the window, saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord. So in this linen ephod, he is leaping and dancing. He is twirling and celebrating. And the house of Israel has joined him and is celebrating too. But she despised him in her heart. Anytime there's a phrase that is exactly the same in two accounts, it's something to be taken notice of. Number one, she did not go to celebrate the ark returning. And number two, all she could do was detest the one who did. And they brought in the ark of the Lord, set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it according to plan. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings to the Lord. A very interesting study all by itself. And when David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the peace offerings, again, if something is repeated, it's pretty significant. He blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. And that remind you of number six, the Lord bless you and keep you. And he distributed among all the people. Listen to this. This is what this is the outpouring of worship and what happens with worship and actually what we're doing today. He distributed among all the people, the whole multitude of Israel, both men and women, those that had come with him on this long journey of, of moving the ark to its proper place. He gave them all, men and women, regardless of age, regardless of stature, a cake of bread, a portion of meat, and a cake of raisins to each one. He fed them. They worshiped as they brought the ark in, and then they feasted together, continuing to celebrate, just as we every week celebrate the sacrifice of the Lord, the victory of the Lord, and the goodness of God when we gather around this table and we partake of the juice and the bread. And like we're going to do at the potluck, what we're doing at the potluck is fun and wonderful, but it is holy ground. Fellowship is beautiful and sacred to God when his people gather together because of him and with him and through him. David is continuing this incredible feast of worship as he gives them food to eat as they rejoiced and worshiped with him as they brought the ark back home. Then all the people departed each to his own house, no doubt reflecting on the joy and the victory of God in those beautiful, beautiful moments. David returned to bless his household. Oh, I love the details. He returned to bless his household. But Michal, the daughter of Saul, more detail, came out to meet David and said, how the king has honored himself today. She was a Southern belle in case you didn't know. Uncovering himself today before the eyes of his servants. <laughs> Female servants, as one of those vulgar fellows, shamelessly uncovers himself. Ugh! That's in the Hebrew, the ugh. And David said to Michal, it was before the Lord who chose me above your father and above all in his house to appoint me as prince over Israel, the people of the Lord. That's who he danced for. And I will celebrate before the Lord. I will make myself even more contemptible than this, and I will be abased in your eyes. But by the female servants of whom you have spoken, by them I shall be held in honor. And Michal, the, son of, the daughter of Saul, had no child to the day of her death. David jumped. As I didn't. Sometimes the goodness of the Lord is going to fill you and you're going to want to jump. But before you do, ask yourself a question. Am I doing this right? It's easy to believe in our own press. 
the press that we write about ourselves. And that can go positive and that can go negative. But really, we should only believe in and follow and obey the press about the Lord. So the sermon title, Jump, and then with exclamation points, Jump. Worship the Lord with everything you've got. But make sure it's not just in the moment that it is backed up or instigated by a life of extreme obedience to God. So we ask ourselves today as a family, we ask ourselves as a family and individually, who do we jump, leap, twirl for? What do we jump, leap, twirl for? What is it that makes our hearts spin enough that we sacrifice and discipline discipline ourselves enough to attain it, to please it? That's your jump with exclamation points. Do we discipline ourselves enough to study God's word? And I mean, really study God's word for who he is, not for who I am. See the difference? We live in a world where individuals are king and queen and want to be exalted as such for their truths for their opinions, for their values. And I'm not saying that we should disrespect anybody. Please don't hear that. But what I am saying is that we, as those who choose to follow God, should value his opinion, his wisdom, far above anyone else's. And that pleasing him is the only thing that we should be after at that level. What makes your heart spin enough that you are willing to sacrifice and discipline yourself in order to please that person or attain that thing? That's your jump. So the question is, who do you leap to? Who do you leap for? Who do you leap towards? Unashamedly, joyfully, wholeheartedly. What makes your heart full? What makes your heart dance? Because the fact of the matter, if we want to be God's people, we claim to be God's people, and by his grace, we are his people. But if we want to be his pleasing people and walk with him in the intimacy that David did, the fact of the matter is that real worship is fueled by, founded on, and preceded by obedience, extreme obedience to the Lord and to his word, to his instructions, to his laws, to his values. With a purposeful stripping away of all the things that this society tries to tell us are truth. We need to allow God's word to speak in God's ways, not filtered through and adjusted according to the perceptions and the values of this world. And that's a hard thing to do. It's an easy thing for me to stand up and say, but it is a hard thing to do. That kind of focus, that kind of obedience, that is the evidence and the product of an absolute respect for God's stature, his powerful, and it's a powerful submission to his greatness and his leadership. And it shows a profound trust in his wisdom and rightness. God is right. That's the only right I'm interested in following. Again, easy to say, hard to do. But it is in that focus that the joy of God overwhelms us. Intimacy with God fills us and flows from us. And those moments of extreme worship burst out of us. I want us as a family to be the kind of place where every once in a while, somebody just screams hallelujah because they can't keep it in. Or if they're a dancer, just 
dances down the aisle so that we can clap because I can't dance with them. Praise team if you'll join me. Great are you, Lord. David leapt and danced before God. And even though it wasn't propriety at its finest, remember propriety is a human construct. And when God fills you to the point where you're just blowing up, just let it go. Propriety. Doesn't even come in second or third or fourth. It's way down the list. When you just got to praise the Lord and worship the Lord and your life is right, praise the Lord and worship the Lord and let me join you. Amen. Let's worship in song.